Uh, so this is going to be a discussion on bleeding per rectum. So this is the outline. I'll first talk a bit about the symptom analysis, and then we'll look at a few case scenarios of bleeding per rectum, but bleeding per rectum with another symptom. For, for example, bleeding with a lump at anus, patient coming with fresh bleeding or hematochesia, uh, bleeding with an alteration of bowel habits, bleeding with loss of weight, etc. Remember, from an exam point of view, you would come across this as a long case. And it's important that you follow, but I always emphasize, a hypothetical deductive approach of history taking in any long case, but also bleeding PR is one of those situations where you can actually show your thought process to the examiner if you follow a good order. Uh, the first thing to do when a patient comes and complains of passing blood from the back passage is to ask about the symptom itself, in this case, passing blood. Uh, so you ask, the first thing to ask is the duration whether it's several days or for years. Sometimes patients have bleeding for years and years and suddenly decide that they want to get some medical attention. Whereas some people come when they notice this immediately. Any of the causes that give rise to bleeding from the back passage can fall into the group of uh, can be found in patients who come to see you uh, as soon as they've noticed this. But if the, if the patient has had this for years, generally it is more likely to be a benign pathology that is giving rise to this bleeding. Generally, if the patient has had bleeding for several years, it's very likely that it's, uh, it's due to a benign cause. But don't forget, there are always situations where the patient may have two pathologies. The patient may initially have had bleeding due to hemorrhoids for years and years, but has now developed a malignancy, which is completely unrelated to the hemorrhoids, but nevertheless is what's causing the bleeding now. This also goes on with the next principle that especially in patients who are say older than 50 years, if they have, if they present with a complaint of passing blood when they defecate, they always need investigations. It may be that they've had hemorrhoids previously, but never attribute the bleeding to hemorrhoids until you've excluded all other sinister causes. So, that's the first thing to elicit, the duration. Obviously, you can ask about the volume of bleeding, but that's a very subjective assessment for two reasons. One, patients don't know how to assess the volume of blood they've lost, except maybe if they notice it on toilet paper, then that's fairly obvious, there's nothing else. But if you ask about volume, it's very subjective. Also because even a drop of blood in the toilet pan will make it very red and the patients will be quite alarmed thinking they've bled a lot but in reality they have not lost a meaningful amount of blood. So it's always good to ask but don't try to differentiate between pathologies based on the amount of bleeding unless it's the patient's very clear that it's a few drops of blood. The next thing you should ask is the type of bleeding. Basically, whether it's fresh blood, which is bright red, or altered blood, which is dark red. And these mean different things and will help you in differentiating your list of differential diagnoses. If the patient sees fresh or bright red blood, all that means is that they've seen that blood soon after it has left the intravascular compartment. That may be due to a number of reasons. In most of the situations, this, they've seen it as soon as it's left the intravascular compartment, 
because the bleeding has happened in a distal part of the lower GI tract. So most likely you see fresh bleeding when the bleeding originates from the rectum or the anal canal, like hemorrhoids. So the moment it bleeds, the patient sees it coming out and the patient sees the blood. So that's why it's bright red. Alternatively, you may see fresh blood in a more proximal bleed, especially if the bleed is massive and the patient has expelled that blood fairly quickly. As you may know, Blood is a cathartic or a laxative. So the moment there is blood inside the digestive tract, it leaves the system fairly quickly. So if there is a massive bleed, even proximally, you may see fresh blood. So seeing bright, bright red blood doesn't always mean it's bled from the rectum or the anal canal. So how do you elicit this? You ask the patient whether the blood they see is bright red, like the blood they would see when they get a cut injury. Altered blood or dark red or maroon blood is blood that has been out of the intravascular compartment for some time. And that's why it has changed the color. So for, for a clot to form, you need to fulfill two criteria. A, the blood has to leave the intravascular compartment and remain in the GI tract for some time, enough time for it to clot. And B, there shouldn't be any liquid stool in that part of bowel when the bleed happens. If, for example, you have bleeding into the small bowel where there is usually liquid stool, the blood will mix with that and therefore, you won't see clots unless uh, there is a massive bleed and there is no food in that digest uh, in that part of the bowel at that moment. Most of most of the time, you would see clots when you have bleeding into the rectum or the distal part of the colon because a the stool is solid so that the blood doesn't mix with the stool, and also most of the time after in a way. After evacuating your bowels, there is usually not much stool in the distal part of the colon until the next day or, or in an average person. So there is enough time for blood to clot without it mixing with the stool. So that's the relevance of clots. And of course, the next thing is the relationship of the bleeding to the stool. So the blood, the patient may see the bleeding independent of the stool, meaning they've gone to the toilet and passed only blood. There was no stool coming out. They may pass the blood at the same time with stool, but this blood is characteristically separate from the stool or the blood may be mixed with the stool. Again, if the patient notices bleeding that is and passes blood independently the patient goes to the toilet and the only thing the patient passes to the toilet is blood that in most of the situations indicate a bleeding that is in the distal part of the digestive tract if the blood is if the patient passes blood with stool but that is separate from the stool again that is a situation where the stool has been fairly well formed and hard stool by the time the blood has entered the GI tract. So that is why it has not mixed with the stool. So again, this is seen generally in left side colonic lesions. If the blood is mixed with stool, it is generally a situation where the bleeding has happened in a part of the GI tract where the stool at that point is liquid. So it has mixed with the blood has mixed with the stool and it has the, and the patient sees it coming out mixed with stool. And I've not listed it here, but I mean, it may be a situation where the patient notices blood on toilet paper after wiping, and that's a very small amount of blood. And generally it may be bleeding that happens in the perineum or the perineal area, 
or a bit of blood that has come from above and has coated the anal canal. So the purpose of this symptom analysis, like in any other situation, but now in the case of a patient with bleeding per rectum, is to see A, what sort of pathology is this, and B, uh, what is the most likely segment of bubble where this bleeding has originated. Uh, so the other symptom that you may want to ask at this point is whether the patient has any pain when they defecate, because that would indicate a lesion in an area which is pain sensitive. And the entire GI tract, except for the lower anal canal and the perineum, are supplied by visceral nerves, which have which do not have sharp pain sensation. They have they are receptive to pain, but that is of visceral nature. If the patient complains of a sharp pain, the lesion is most likely going to be in the low in the lower anal canal or the perineum. Once you've done your symptom analysis, the next step to do is to look at associated symptoms. And in this case, in a patient who has bleeding per rectum, the associated symptoms would indicate bubble habits, tenismus, sensation of incomplete empty, their appetite and their weight, whether they have any other bleeding manifestations, and any family history of malignancy. These are, of course, components of your history, but in a hypothetical deductive approach, you would ask them in the areas that are more relevant than where they belong in the list. If you look at alteration of bowel habits, there are two main forms that a patient may notice an alteration. It may either be constipation predominant or diarrhea predominant. Or, which means loose tools. So constipation, either of these can be due to benign and malignant causes. It's very important that you establish this alteration in the early part of your history. If the patient says they had constipation predominant alteration of bowel habits, a benign cause would be something like a patient with hypothyroidism, having constipation, and the constipation itself may have led to hemorrhoids. Malignancy causing constipation predominant bowel habit, uh, change of bowel habits would be a cancer causing the luminal narrowing, and the same cancer causing bleeding. Alternatively, if the patient complains of diarrhea predominant alteration or the passage of loose stools, it may be a patient who has ulcerative colitis, where the disease causes both loose stools and bleeding, or a neoplasm, either a villous adenoma or even a cancer that causes mucus secretion, where the patient perceives either loose stools or the passage of mucus. This differentiation is also important because sometimes people go with the idea that Alteration of bowel habits means the same thing. And when you're asked about, ask for differential diagnosis in a patient who has bleeding PR, uh, your next response is indiscriminately give uh, differential diagnosis without characterizing what predominant al alteration of bowel habits it is. So if the patient has, for example, constipation predominant bowel alteration of bowel habits, ulcerative colitis is rather unlikely because ulcerative colitis generally does not cause a constipation predominant type by itself. So it is very important that you make this differentiation quite early in your history and use this when you're assessing the symptoms and developing differential diagnosis.
the next symptom you should assess is tenesmus. Uh, there is no formal definition for tenesmus, especially rect some people talk about rectal tenesmus and bladder tenesmus. Bladder tenesmus is what you would call strangury. Uh, if generally tenesmus means rectal tenesmus, uh, it is practically defined as a painful, fruitless desire to defecate. So there must be pain associated with this, and this pain is generally a low pelvic or a perineal pain, not an abdominal pain. And it is generally a fruitless desire to defecate, meaning the patient goes to the toilet but does not pass anything. How do you ask for this? Well, you use that definition to ask. You ask the patient, do you get a pain before going to the toilet with an urge to go to the toilet? If you look at the pathophysiology of tenesmus, that generally indicates that that can happen due to a number of reasons. It can happen due to inflammation. For example, patients with ulcerative colitis who have severe proctitis will have tenesmus. Similarly, tumors where there is an inflammatory component will also give rise to tenesmus. Tumors can also give rise to tenesmus due to different reasons. So if the tumor is infiltrating, this can also give rise to tenesmus. Now, remember, I said tenesmus is due to the involvement of the neural plexus, the Auerbach's and the Meissner's plexus. So what this means is that whatever the pathology that is there needs to involve these neural plexus. If the patient is having ulcerative proctitis, this means the inflammation is severe enough for it to reach the deeper layers of the rectum. It is no longer confined to the mucosa. Similarly, if the patient has a malignancy, if that patient has tenesmus, that indicates the patient has, the malignancy has reached the neural plexus, meaning it has invaded deep. You're not, it's unlikely that you will see tenesmus in early stage cancers, unless there is a significant inflammatory component to that tumor. Sensation of incomplete emptying is a slightly different complaint. What this means is the patient goes to the toilet and after coming back from the toilet, still feels like they've not fully emptied their bowels. And that's a working definition. How do you ask for this? You ask the patient whether they, when they come back after defecating, whether they still feel there is something left. Why do patients develop this? Well, they, the simple answer is patients develop this because they have something in their rectum that they perceive as stool after coming back after defecating. And this may happen due to a number of reasons. If the patient has an intrarectal intersusception, for example, which is an early stage of rectal prolapse, that intersusception, which you can see in the pictures B and C, that mass will be perceived by the rectum as a mass. And the patient will feel that though they have evacuated their mouse, there's still something left inside the rectum. Similarly, if the patient has a cancer, that mass may be perceived by the rectum as a lump of stool, and the patient will feel that they have not fully emptied. But does it mean in practical sense? Well, that means that there is a mass somewhere in the rectum, or there is a lesion that the patient is perceiving as a mass in the rectum. So if it's a malignancy, that malignancy is big enough for the patient to perceive it as a mass. So you're not going to get this 
in a patient who has a tumor that is very small. If a patient has sensation of incomplete emptying due to a tumor, he is going to be a big tumor. It's not something that you're going to miss by examination or endoscopy. There's also a slight difference in the assessment of tenesmus and sensitive incomplete empty. Tenesmus is predominantly a sensation that the patient gets before going to the toilet. And sensation of incomplete emptying is a symptom that the patient will see or feel after coming back after defecation. And you can see with your symptom analysis and assessment of associated symptoms, you can localize the tumor and identify the pathology fairly accurately even before examining this patient. It is also good to ask about the appetite and the weight or weight change in a patient who comes with bleeding per rectum. The weight change may be subjective where the patient says they've lost weight, they feel that clothes are too loose, but there is no evidence that they've lost weight. They've never weighed themselves. Or it could be very objective evidence of weight loss where they say, I check my weight monthly and I've noticed a change of six kilos over the last two months. Both benign and malignant causes can give rise to weight loss. Benign things like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis can very well cause a loss of appetite and a resultant loss of weight because of the inflammatory process. And of course, malignancy can cause a loss of appetite and loss of weight uh, due when the, especially colorectal malignancy, when the metastatic and has most likely metastasis in the liver or has a large metastatic burden. Again, early stage cancers, assuming there is no obstruction, is unlikely to cause a loss of appetite and loss of weight, especially if they're not metastatic. Bleeding manifestations are relevant because obviously the patient comes with a complaint of bleeding. Though we suspect that this might be due to uh, an, an anatomical abnormality or a structural abnormality in the digestive tract, it is always possible that the patient has some hematological condition. Uh, the patients may be on warfarin and they may know that they may not know that the INR is abnormally high. The patients may be having liver impairment, which they didn't know. Patients may be having a platelet abnormality, or it may even be structural conditions which are not confined to the colon or the anal canal, which the patient may be having. So it's always good to ask about bleeding manifestations and also even any etiological factors which may give rise to this. In a long case, it's also good to ask about the family history at this point because a malignancy, given if it's the appropriate age, is a differential diagnosis that you must consider. And although uncommon, a family history or hereditary cancer is one possible etiology. So it is always good to ask the family history in your, in your assessment of the patient rather than later in your history as a part of your family history. So what is a significant family history for a patient with cancer or suspecting of cancer? If the patient says, well, my maternal uncle had colorectal cancer at the age of 70, is it relevant? Not really. For all practical purposes, you consider a patient to be at high risk or at significant risk due to family risk, uh, family history, if a first degree relative has colorectal cancer younger than 60 years, anything more is more likely to be 
a sporadic cancer. If the patient says, I've had multiple family members developing cancer, it could very well be a cancer syndrome. The commonest ones we deal with are familial adenomatous polyposis and hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. There are different diagnostic criteria, but know the concepts of that there are different cancer syndromes and there are different associated other cancers in these patients. Once you've established the features that I've just listed, you can move on to the examination. This includes general examination, abdominal examination, digital examination, and proctoscopy. General examination would include things like pallor or other features of anemia, weight loss, bleeding manifestations, especially if they have other cutaneous bruising or other bleeding manifestations, and for example, extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. It's good to mention this and good to actively look for this when you're examining the patient, but if they're absent, I wouldn't go with an exhaustive list of negative findings and present, especially at an exam. Then you move on to your abdominal examination. The patient may have a scaphoid abdomen, especially in patients with CBIBD, especially Crohn's disease. They lose a lot of weight and the patient may have a scaphoid abdomen, or the patient may have abdominal distension. In, with relevance to uh, bleeding PR, this may be a malignancy or even long-standing IBD, for that matter, causing a stricture, which may be causing partial obstruction, or it even may be ascites due to either hyperproteinemia of IBD or malignant deposits malignant peritoneal deposits or hepatic deposits due to cancer. And especially in thin patients, you may feel a mass. If the malignancy in the colon is big enough, if the patient is thin enough, uh, you may feel a mass, uh, you may feel a cancer as a mass. Abdominal examination is not complete without uh, rectal examination. And it's especially important uh, in these patients who have bleeding uh, as their presenting complaint. In your examination, you always inspect the perianal area for a number of things. You look for fistulae, you look for fissures, you look for skin tags. And all of these can be seen in patients with Crohn's disease. About a quarter of patients with Crohn's disease will manifest with perianal complaints only before their diagnosis of Crohn's disease is made. So inspect, by inspecting alone, you may be able to narrow your differential diagnosis. In your examination of the digital examination of the anal canal and the rectum, you would look for masses, you would look for ulcers, and you might even see blood on your examining finger if there is blood in the rectum or the anus at that point. Your proctoscopy also helps you visualize your anal canal and the lower rectum, which, and also it will make you, it will enable you to see the upper rectum where you cannot reach with your examining finger. So it is mandatory as a doctor that you do a digital examination and a proctoscopy in a patient who comes with bleeding per rectum. Proctoscopy is not a specialized test and 
a doctor with MBBS should be able to do this. Once you have evaluated your patients with your history taking and examination and narrowed down your differential diagnosis, it is time to investigate these patients. I will talk about specific investigations later on in the relevant sections, but broadly speaking, your investigations may be hematological, imaging, and endoscopy. Hematological investigations can be related to the primary pathology. It may be to look for complications, and it may be to decide on the management of the patient. If the patient has cancer, for example, the patient would require a CEA level for uh, preoperatively as, as a baseline, as well as postoperative. If the patient has inflammatory bowel disease, especially ulcerative colitis, you would do a CRP level to assess the level of their inflammation. If the bleeding has gone on for a long time, you would look for anemia and you would require a full blood count to look at the hemoglobin level. And to decide on further management, especially if you're deciding on colonoscopy, where the patient requires bowel preparation, or the patient requires a contrast enhanced CT, it's important to know about the renal functions, and you would need a creatinine level. Imaging in these patients could vary from X-ray to ultrasound to contrast enhanced CT to MRI and PET. And what you would do would depend on what you're trying to find by investigating this patient. If the patient is constipated or if you're suspecting obstruction, for example, an abdominal X-ray would be required. Ultrasound has very limited scope except for repeated imaging, like in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, because you don't, don't want to expose them to too much radiation because they will eventually need imaging throughout their life. Contrast in NCT is the mainstay of evaluating these complaints, especially the most serious ones. MRI is either to look at small bowel in the form of an MRI enteroclysis, in uh, Crohn's disease, or to assess the local staging in rectal cancer. PET CTs are generally limited to assessing metastatic disease in rectal cancer. It is not done for all patients, but it is done when you want to look at the metabolic activity of a suspicious area identified in the CT. In the evaluation of the colon and the rectum, there are two forms of endoscopy. You can do a flexible sigma endoscopy or colonoscopy. This, the scope of this talk today goes beyond discussing these investigations, but you need to know when to do what investigation, how to prepare the patients for each of these investigations, and the advantages and disadvantages of these investigations. Generally, if it's a patient who comes with fresh bleeding, we are suspecting the bleeding to be in the left side of the colon, that patient could be evaluated with a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Whereas if you're suspecting an alteration of bile habits and suspecting a right-sided tumor, right-sided problem, then the patient would require a colonoscopy. Preparation, flexible sigmoidoscopy is simple enough. The patient requires only an enema. Colonoscopy requires formal bowel preparation or mechanical bowel preparation, most commonly using polyethylene glycol. There are various regimes, uh, but the patient requires polyethylene glycol uh, for, clean, uh, for mechanical clearance of the colon. Each of these has its own advantage and disadvantage, and the patients will most likely want to know why you're picking one or the other. The biggest advantage of 
flexible sigmoid endoscopy is it's an outpatient procedure the patient doesn't require bowel prep it's only an enema patient comes to the hospital or the endoscopy suite gets it done and goes home no admission no unpleasant bowel prep the disadvantage here is you're only examining a part of the colon so there is a chance that you will miss proximal lesions so that is why it's important that you choose the right investigation for the right patient the advantage of colonoscopy is that you visualize the whole colon so the chances of missing a lesion is rather low but it requires formal bowel prep patients don't always like it also it needs it needs sedation so the patient needs to be observed for a few hours after their test okay so that is the symptom assessment of bleeding per rectum which you should do as a doctor but more importantly you should have that hypothetical deductive approach to patient assessment and symptom analysis in a patient okay now that we have looked at the symptom analysis and how to assess the symptoms and work on have a list of working differential diagnoses let's look at a few case scenarios and we would encounter what i've spoken just now about the symptom analysis when we encounter these uh, cases so patient number 1 is a 50 year old male that presents with a 5 day history of passing fresh blood per anus so you have a 50 year old male five days of bleeding fairly it's come to see you fairly early there is there are no clots no alteration of bowel habits no painful defecation and no weight loss so he doesn't have any high risk features and what do we do next we examine the patient he is well looking he is not pale do the abdominal examination the abdomen is normal and your digital rectal examination and the digital rectal examination is also normal so so far he has had bleeding for 5 days but you've not noticed anything in the history or the examination of this patient so what do you do next you do a proctoscopy and you will see hemorrhoids it is very important that you know and that you understand that hemorrhoids cannot be palpated in a digital rectal examination unless the hemorrhoids have thrombosed in which case you will feel a hard area or a hard mass most hemorrhoids are soft and you will not feel them when you insert your finger they are also collapsible they are venous uh, sinusoids and they will collapse so you will not feel hemorrhoids you will also not see hemorrhoids unless they are fourth degree when you inspect the perineum so the only way you are going to diagnose hemorrhoids or say the patient does not have hemorrhoids is by doing proctoscopy when you do this you insert the proctoscope all the way into the rectum and then you remove the obturator and as you move the outer sheath outwards the hemorrhoids will all of a sudden prolapse into your proctoscope and that is how you identify generally they are seen in the classical locations of 3711 where you find the vena comitante so the accompanying veins of the superior rectal artery inferior artery and you can classify them or grade them depending on the extent that they 
come out of the anal canal. So grade one is very early. It doesn't come out. You only identify it through an endoscopy or a proctoscopy. Grade two will come out, but it will go back in spontaneously. Grade three will come out, but will require manual reduction. And grade four will not go back in. Most of this can be elicited from the history, grades one to the, all of it, because the patient will say, I don't feel there's a mess, or I feel there's a mess, which I need, which I need goes back automatically, or I need to push it back in. Or there is a mass that is always there. It used to go back in, but now it doesn't. And I cannot get that to go back in. This is important because your management will depend on this. So generally, grade one, where there is no lung, the patients are treated with sclerotherapy. Grade two patients, where the lung comes out but goes back in spontaneously, will be treated with banding. Grades three and four will require hemorrhoidectomy. That's the classical management plan. There are also novel options. And sometimes patients may ask you. And the new options include laser and Doppler-guided ligation. Grade one hemorrhoids cannot be treated with banding. They're too small to be caught with a band. Grade two hemorrhoids, well, you can inject them, but they're not really going to settle unless they're very early grade two. Grade two. Grade three and four, obviously can be banded, but banding is not sufficient for them to be treated. Other causes of hematochesia or fresh bleeding per rectum include cancer and polyps, fissures, fistulae, and warts. Now, you notice that most of these are pathology either in the perineum or the lower part of the digestive tract. And I told you that you get fresh bleeding. And in most cases, that is because the patient has noticed blood as soon as it has come out or left the intravascular compartment. And that is why your list of differential diagnoses includes things that are in the distal digestive tract. Uh, I'll deal with some of these later on in the cases. Patient number two is a 30 year old female who complains of passage of bright red blood and defecation for two days duration. So a young female, again, fresh bleeding and short history. Different from our earlier patient, who was older, but also of a short duration of bleeding. In contrast to the first patient, this patient has been constipated for the last five days and also has painful defecation. She does not have clots and does not have batons. What do you do? Well, you examine the patient, you do a general examination, and the general examination is normal. You do an abdominal examination, and that is also normal. In a patient like this, what should you do next? You should not do a digital rectal examination. These patients most likely have anal fissures, and they will not tolerate a digital rectal examination and they will most likely kick backwards if you try to insert your finger. A gentle inspection of the perineum while parting the mucose, uh, parting the skin, will give you your diagnosis. Most, the most common site for a fissure is at six o'clock position. There are various theories, but that's the commonest position. You may also get fissures at 12 o'clock position. Fissures at any other position is very uncommon. If somebody has 
atypical fissures, meaning fissures at atypical locations, or recurrent fissures should always suspect whether they have an underlying pathology or underlying disease like Crohn's disease as the underlying cause for their recurrent or abnormal or unusual fissures. Management of an acute fissure is conservative. And this conservative management includes a number of different regimes or number of different goals to achieve. First, the patient requires a laxative. They most likely develop this because they are constipated long term, or at least they've been constipated for a few days. That the passage of a hard stool, a hard mass of stool, has caused this fissure. So the common, common laxatives that are available are lactulose and cremophene. Lactulose has sugar, so it is discouraged in patients with diabetes. So you use cremophene in those patients, but both are equally effective. So the first thing is that patients require a laxative. Second, you must give them sufficient pain relief. A fissure is an extremely painful condition, so they require enough pain relief, especially so that they don't postpone going to the toilet, which will worsen their constipation. So you can use both topical analgesia as well as oral analgesia. Topical analgesia is most commonly given in the form of lignocaine gel. Lignocaine gel takes five to 10 minutes at least to work as a surface anesthetic. So when you're giving it, you advise the patient that they need to apply this at least 10 minutes before going to the toilet if they want to have minimum pain when they go to the toilet. Oral analgesia includes paracetamol and NSAIDs. If the patient is prone to developing gastritis, you may combine a PPI with this, but you need multimodal analgesia. The next aspect of managing an acute fissure is to allow the fissure to heal. Most fissures will heal if the sphincter spasm did not compromise the blood supply to that area. So you need to relax the sphincter. The commonest drug used to relax the sphincter is 2% diltiazem. Diltiazem is a calcium channel blocker and it blocks the calcium channels in the muscles in the anal sphincter and relaxes the anal canal so that the fissure may heal. Historically, GTN has been used. There are G commercial preparations of GTN and sometimes people even crush GTN tablets and apply them topically. The problem with topical GTN is like every other nitrate, they cause cerebral vasodilatation and cause unbearable headaches. The headaches are often said to be worse than the pain of the fissure. So this is why GTN has fallen out of fashion. So it is 2% DLTSM that is commonly used. And you advise the patient that you use these religiously for six weeks. And in all likelihood, your fissure will heal. In fact, 75 to 80% at least will heal with conservative management within six weeks. It is important that you advise the patient that when they're applying the gel, be it lignocaine or diltiazem, that they ensure that it's applied to the anal canal and not only the perianal area. So they need to apply it inside the anal canal as well. If the fissure does not settle in six weeks, or if it settles and the patient gets another fissure, they would require a more definitive management. And that is given in the form of botulinum toxin injection. Botulinum toxin is a paralytic agent which paralyzes the muscle for six months. That is enough time for any fissure to heal. 
and then the action of the Botox is over and the sphincter muscles come back to their previous state. There is no long-term impairment of sphincter function. This is in contrast to the internal sphincterotomy or a lateral sphincterotomy, which has which is which was historically performed and it's still performed because this causes irreversible injury to the anal sphincter. A fissure is most is most often a short-standing problem, but an internal sphincterotomy, the damage is lifelong. This is especially discouraged in young females who may have further sphincter damage during childbirth. So most of the time, Botox injections would suffice for chronic or recurrent fissions. Other painful conditions coming with bleeding parectum would include fistulae, abscesses, especially if they're associated with the fistula, and perianal hematomas. Now, a perianal hematoma by itself will not give rise to bleeding, but may be associated with hemorrhoids, because both of these are associated with constipation. Patient number three is a 65-year-old male who complains of passing blood for two weeks. So you have an older patient, male, passing blood for two weeks. He's also noticed the passage of clots. Though he's had bleeding for the last two weeks, he's had constipation for the last three months. He has sensation of incomplete emptying and he has tenesmus. You examine the patient, you see that there is a bit of weight loss. Abdominal examination is distended. There is fullness in the left lower quadrant, but you are unable to feel any masses. When you do a digital rectal examination, you would identify that you identify there is a mass in the rectum about seven centimeters from the anal verge, that's at the tip of your finger, and there is blood on the examining finger. And when you do a proctoscopy, you would see the lesion. Seven centimeters is well within the reach of a proctoscope. And you would see the lesion as soon as you insert the proctoscope. Now you see in the history, if you elicit these features, the patient, though the history of bleeding is for two weeks, there is clots, there is constipation for the last three months, which may be related to this. It may very well be a patient who's hypothyroid, who's been constipated, who has noticed hemorrhoids. But it may also be a malignancy, and that is causing a luminal narrowing, giving rise to constipation, predominant alteration of bowel habits. The patient has sensation of incomplete emptying, indicating it is a large mass if it's a malignancy. And the patient has teresmus, which indicates or which suggests that the tumor has at least invaded the deeper plexus or it has an inflammatory response that is causing an inflammation of the neural plexus. So it is not going to be an early stage tumor or a small tumor. Then you see this constellation of symptoms and signs you're fairly certain that it's an advanced cancer. So you've examined, you've done a proctoscopy, and now is the time to investigate the patient. So on a broad aspect, you investigate these patients for, to achieve a definitive diagnosis, and because it's cancer, you need to stage the patient. You may want some cancer-related investigations. 
And you also want to assess fitness for surgery. Your definite diagnosis is going to come in the form of a colonoscopy and biopsy. Can you do a flexible sigmoidoscopy because the patient has left-sided symptoms? You can, but in patients who are older than 60, and there is a significant chance of identifying malignancy, you would prefer to do a colonoscopy. If you palpate, if you do a digital examination and palpate, and you know there's a cancer, there is no doubt that the patient requires a colonoscopy. Colonoscopy will give you the opportunity to obtain, obtain biopsies for definitive diagnosis of the malignancy. And it will also help in identifying coexistent polyps or other pathology. In this patient, there is you no know, suspicion of irritable, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but it can be a patient who has long-standing inflammatory bowel disease that has developed cancer. So it is very possible that uh, you need to evaluate the rest of the colon for features or other pathology. Also, colorectal cancers happen in the adenoma carcinoma sequence, and there is a significant chance that you will identify polyps in these patients. So you need to assess the entire colon before you can decide on what management the patient will have. Once a cancer is diagnosed, uh, once there is a definitive diagnosis of cancer, you need to stage the disease. Uh, historically, you had people use the Duke stage for cancer, but now you use the PNM classification for staging. The mainstay of your staging would include a contrast intensity chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and an MRI pelvis. You do a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis, chest because you're looking for lung meds. Abdomen, because you're looking for A, liver meds, and B, whether there are other colonic pathology, whether there is obstruction causing colonic distension, and other metastatic manifestations in, inside the abdomen, and pelvis, to look at any regional, local regional spread. MRI pelvis is done primarily to assess the T and N states of the rectal cancer, because you want to see the mesorectal and the mesorectal fascia before you decide on the management. Other cancer-related investigations would include the CEA level, which you need preoperatively as your baseline level, because that is a part of surveillance to identify recurrence of cancer. So you would require the CEA level before surgery. The definitive management is going to be in the form of surgery. It may be preceded by neoadjuvant therapy, but you would uh, require, the patient would require surgery. So it is important that you assess the fitness of the patient to undergo surgery. Fitness for surgery can be assessed in a number of ways. There are clinical assessments of the fitness of surgery. In terms of investigations, you would require, the patient would require an ECG and an echo to assess the cardiac status and a cardiopulmonary exercise testing to assess the cardiopulmonary status. CPEX is not done for all patients. It is available. It is done in an selected situations, uh, but that is a more composite measure of the cardiopulmonary reserves. When the patient is getting ready for colonoscopy, these are the things that you need to discuss with the patient. When you're obtaining consent, you need to discuss the complications, the common ones and the uncommon but serious ones like bleeding, perforation, the chance of missing a polyp, the side effects of medication, etc. You also need to advise the patient on bowel preparation. The commonest agent that is used for bowel preparation 
is polyethylene glycol. There are different regimes. There are other preparations as well, but that's the most common preparation worldwide. The patient also needs to understand that the colonoscopy is performed under sedation. Commonly, this is pethidine and midazolam. Some centers may use propofol, uh, but it is done under sedation. So the patient is unable to go home immediately or for that matter, drive back home. So the patient needs to come with somebody who is able to take responsibility of the patient until they go home. The other uncommon but possible uh, situation where you have is an incomplete colonoscopy. For a number of reasons, the endoscopies may fail to go to the cecum. What are the options? Well, you can repeat the colonoscopy on another day, and in most situations, that would suffice. If there was, if this was a difficult colonoscopy, and you think visualizing the entire colon, even in a subsequent colonoscopy, is fairly unlikely, your other options include double contrast barium enema or a CT virtual colonoscopy. Double contrast enemas are getting less and less common because of CT virtual colonoscopy. And a CT virtual colonoscopy is, has comparable outcomes, uh, comparable to colonoscopy for polyps more than one centimeter. It is not as effective as colonoscopy for sub-centimeter polyps, but it is an option. And there are ways of doing virtual colonoscopy for patients without bowel prep. So if somebody is adamant that they cannot tolerate bowel prep, there are ways of doing it with uh, special contrast media, media uh, without bowel prep. And these options must be discussed when you're discussing colonoscopy in the patient. Contrast enhanced CTs are uh, use contrast, which is iodine based. Uh, I mentioned earlier, they, you look at the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And in this patient, where you identified a tumor, you use it to look at the level of the tumor and the size of the tumor, infiltration of surrounding area, surrounding organs in a female may go towards the uterus or the vagina. In a male, it may go towards the bladder. You would also look for metastasis in the liver, lung, and the vertebrae. And you may even see upstream changes due to obstruction. The side effects and complications must also be discussed with a patient especially the chance of developing an allergy react, allergic reaction to iodine-based contrast and the exposure to radiation. Uh, Contrast-enhanced CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis usually requires the exposure of about 400 chest x-rays. So you don't do this indiscriminately, and you only do it if it is required. And this is what a tumor would look like. So you would see the thickening around, uh, thickening in that segment, which extends outside, maybe even invading, in this patient invading the abdominal wall. And you might see liver metastases, which are hypo-enhancing lesions in the liver, in the portal in space. And then you come to treatment. In most cancers, mo most colorectal cancers, except in very selected situations, your definitive treatment is going to be surgery. Non-operative treatment are, are non-operative treatment is an option for early stage rectal cancer in good prognostic patients, but 
for all practical purposes, most patients with colorectal cancer will require surgery. Most patients will also require chemoradiotherapy. In rectal cancer, almost all patients, except for very early cancer, will require neoadjuvant therapy. And in both colon and rectal cancers, most patients will require adjuvant chemotherapy. Generally, there is no adjuvant radiotherapy. Having a colon cancer or having surgery for colon or rectal cancer does not equate to having a stoma always. Most colon and rectal cancers can be dealt without the patient requiring a stoma. In most of the situations, if the patient requires a stoma, in most situations, this is going to be a temporary stoma. Only in a very selected number of situations or selected patients will there be a permanent stoma. When would patients require stoma in colorectal cancer? Well, if the patient has a low rectal cancer, where the sphincter cannot be preserved without compromising the oncological principles, then the patient will undergo an abdominal perineal resection, meaning there is no anal canal for you to anastomose. So the patient will require an end colostomy in the left iliac fossa. That is most likely the only situation where the patient will have a permanent stoma. If the patient presents with an obstructing tumor, the surgeon may decide the patient requires a defunctioning colostomy or an ileostomy for the patient, for the, for the obstruction to be relieved. And then the patient will undergo definitive therapy and this stoma would be reversed. So this is a defunctioning stoma and it's a temporary stoma. Similarly, if the patient has a low rectal cancer and undergoes surgery after neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, because radiotherapy and even chemotherapy impairs healing, and there is a chance of a low anastomosis healing more, the patient may require a temporary ileostomy until the anastomosis heals. This again is a temporary stoma and the anastomosis uh, until anastomosis heals and will be reversed soon. So as you can see, in most situations, the stomas patients require are temporary stomas, which will soon be reversed. Only a very small number of patients will require a permanent stoma. Treatment of cancer does not end at treating the, or the definitive management after surgery. Patients need to be followed up for five years. Generally, if a patient remains recurrence free from a colorectal cancer at five years, they're considered cured of their disease. There is hardly any possibility of developing a recurrence of the original cancer beyond five years. Their follow-up is more frequent in the first two years and less frequent in the subsequent years. Uh, this again is because the chances of getting a recurrence is more frequent in the first two years. The components of this follow-up include clinical assessment, including history and examination, colonoscopy, CT scans, and CEA levels. All of these are done more frequently in the first, three year, first two years and less frequently or in, in, in increasing intervals in the next three years. Now we come to our next patient. This is a 25-year-old female who complains of passage of altered blood with stool for four months. Her bowel habits are now more diarrhea predominant. And she has also noticed a weight loss of 10 kilos over three months. So a fairly young patient, altered blood, four months, 
Dara predominant bowel habits has lost 10 kilos over three months, has also got a poor appetite and colicky abdominal pain. When you examine this patient, you notice that the patient is pale, the patient has lost some weight, it's a scaphoid abdomen, there's tenderness in the right lower quadrant. Digital rectal examination reveals erythematous skin and a fistula. So this patient most likely has inflammatory bowel disease, most likely Crohn's disease, which has given rise to the change of bowel habits, weight loss, as well as the perineal findings. But investigations, does a patient with Crohn's disease or IBD require? They require a colonoscopy and segmental biopsies. This will give you a definitive diagnosis as well as an idea of the extent of the disease. You, you need to know whether it's only left side of the colon, whether it's pancolitis, whether it involves the ileum, and the extent of the inflammation. You can also do fecal calprotectin. It helps in the, in the diagnosis and it helps monitor the response to treatment. If you're suspecting small bowel disease due to Crohn's disease, the patient will require an MRI enterocolysis. This will show any strictures, ongoing inflammation, and any abnormality in the small bowel. As far as treatment of Crohn's disease is concerned, or any IBD is concerned, this has two main objectives, achieve remission and maintain remission. How you achieve remission will depend on the extent of the disease, the severity of the inflammation, and a number of other factors. One of the commonest agents used are steroids, but because of the side effect profile of steroids, you generally don't treat patients for a long time with steroids. And as soon as remission is achieved, you tail them off. Remission can also be achieved through immunomodulators like azathioprine or biological therapy like infliximab, which is the TNF-alpha, a monoclonal antibody against DNF alpha. Once you've achieved remission, then you need an agent to maintain remission. This again depends on a number of factors, but you can use pretty much the same agents except steroids because you try to avoid long-term steroids because of the side effects. So you can use immunomodulators like azathioprine or biological therapy like infliximab to maintain remission. Some patients with inflammatory bowel disease will require surgery. Some of these situations may be emergencies, some may be urgencies, and some may be elective surgery. The common reasons to require surgery include stricturing disease, which do not respond to medical management, and poor response to medical treatment or if the patient is developing side effects due to treatment. We come to our fifth patient. is a 40-year-old female presenting with passage of blood and mucus. And this blood and mucus passage is unrelated to bowel movements. The bowel habits are regular. You do a general examination, that is normal. You do an abdominal examination, and that is also normal. But your perineal examination will require, will reveal these abnormalities. So this patient has a fistula in anal, and the external opening is at two or three o'clock position. 
fissuli may be classified or are classified according to their relationship to the anal sphincter. There are very superficial or submucosal sphincters which do not go across the anal sphincter. But other ones either go in between the sphincters like intersphincteric fistulae, go, go through both of them like a transphincteric fistulae, or go above them like a suprasphincteric or extrasphincteric fistulae. When you talk about fistulae, you also need to remember the Goodsall's law or Goodsall's rule. Goodsall's rule it states that if you draw a line between three and nine o'clock positions in the anal canal, any fistula with an opening anterior to this is very likely to have a long, is likely to have a direct path entering the anal canal, in which case the internal opening is also likely to be in that area of the perineum or the anal canal. In contrast, fistulae, which have openings posterior to this, most likely take a curved path and enter at six o'clock position. Obviously, there are exceptions to any rule, and you can have long anterior fistulae, which although open anteriorly, still enter the anal canal at six o'clock position. But generally, the openings of these long fistulae are quite further apart in the perineum. There are a number of treatment options for fistulae. And because of their relationship to the anal sphincter, we generally treat them in the order of ascending complexity or ascending damage to the sphincter. One of the commonest options used for fistulae are setons. They can be draining setons, like the picture you see here, or cutting setons. The purpose of a draining seton is to ensure that the secretions that accumulate inside the fistula drain out and do not give rise to abscess formation. A cutting seton, on the other hand, exerts continuous pressure causing cutting of the tissue. Laying open or fistulotomy is another option, especially for fistulae that not, do not involve much of the inner sphincter. So they can be laid open, but laying open means you're dividing all the sphincter tissue between the fissure and the anal canal. So you cannot do this for fistulae that are high or in involve significant amount of tissue or, or sphincter tissue. Fistulectomy, on the other hand, is a situation where the surgeon removes the entire fistula tract surgically. There are novel options of dealing with fistulae, like phylac, which is fistula lace associated closure, uh, where you use a laser to ablate the fistula tissue and to heal it. Similarly, you can use a videoscope to look inside the fistula and to clean and he uh, facilitate healing in a fistula. Flap surgery is where you use tissue from another part of the body. In this case, it can be either a flap from the rectum or the lower anal canal to cover the internal opening. This works on the hypothesis that it's the persistence of the, the internal opening that keeps the fistula secreting and propagating. So once you close this, the fistula heals. There are other causes of bleeding, which these case scenarios have not included, like diverticular disease, rectal prolapse, 
and polyps. Diverticular disease is a spectrum. You have diverticulosis, which is the presence of diverticula, diverticulitis, which is inflammation of these diverticula, and diverticular bleeding. Diverticular bleeding is generally massive bleeding. You're not going to see patients coming with few bleeding, noticing a few drops of blood due to diverticular bleeds. Diverticular bleeds happen because as the diverticular diverticulum enlarges, it because it has originated at a weakness where the vessels penetrate the bubble wall, the enlarging diverticulum will cause pressure on this blood vessels, eroding it and eventually causing bleeding. So these bleeding are massive bleeds and the patient will not come with a few drops of blood. So don't include diverticular disease as a differential diagnosis in long-standing bleeding or patients coming with a few drops of blood. Rectal prolapse is where the rectum prolapses through the anal canal or descends through the anal canal lower than its normal anatomical position. It can have, it, it has varying degrees of descent and you may get bleeding or the, the patient may get bleeding due to a number of reasons. There can be trauma to the mucosa because the rectum is outside the anal canal or there may be venous congestion because of the compression of the rectum by the anal sphincter. So this you will identify when you examine the patient. If you, if the patient has a rectal prolapse, it may be eroded, there might be erosions due to trauma, or you would see it congested. Okay. Now that we have looked at a few case scenarios of patients with bleeding, uh, let's go back to our original assessment in the form of a summary. So when a patient presents with bleeding per rectum, you should first do a symptom analysis to assess the amount of bleeding, the site of bleeding, the most likely cause of bleeding, and the severity of bleeding. Then you should look for red flag symptoms indicating the presence of a malignancy or even things like IBD, which are though benign, can have serious consequences. You also need to assess risk factors for the bleeding or the underlying pathology and examine the patient, which includes general examination, abdominal examination, rectal examination, and proctoscopy. Investigations include endoscopy, imaging, and biochemistry. Endoscopy is flexible sigma endoscopy and colonoscopy. You need to know the differences between the two investigations, their advantages and disadvantages, and why one was picked over the other. Imaging, commonly CT and MRI. You need to know how to prepare them, how to prepare a patient for these, and the advantages and disadvantages of these. Biochemistry includes things like talpredectin, CEA, but also things like hemoglobin, if you're assessing for anemia after bleeding, or due to bleeding, creatinine to look at the renal function part investigations. And of course, you have other investigations that would help govern you, uh, which governs the treatment in deciding fitness for surgery. 